Hey there, it's Bree, and these are my recent reads. It's been a little while since I've done a recent reads, and that's mostly because I've been doing a lot of vlogs lately, so I've been talking about the books that I've been reading in those vlogs, but there have been a handful of books that I've read in between those vlogs, and I'm going to talk about them with you today. The first book was The Fine Print. It's Dreamland Billionaires, book number one by Lauren Asher. This is a book that I read for an exclusive reading vlog for my members. They had voted, they had nominated and voted on this book, did a whole dedicated reading vlog on this book. Interestingly enough, I knew nothing about this book before going into it. Dreamland is kind of like Disney World and the hero in this, he belongs to the family that founded it. So he works for the company and everything. And this is one of those situations where he will inherit, I think, a portion of the business after his uncle died. I think it's his uncle. It's been a while since I've read it. He inherits a portion of it as long as he completes this task. And I think the whole series follows him and his brothers completing these tasks so that they can each get a share in this business. And I think it's because their dad's kind of horrible and they're trying to keep it away from him. And the only way they can do that is by completing these tasks. I think maybe the next book is A Marriage of convenience or something like that because I know one of the brothers has to get married but this particular brother has to rework the business plan a little bit he has to improve something in the business model so he goes to the ground level and it just so happens that the heroine works at dreamland she's a makeup artist for like the little girls who like dress up as princesses or whatever and they end up meeting and having a really great meet cute I really like their meet cute at a meeting that he is in she doesn't know who he is but it's one of those like definitely grumpy sunshine he's very like like stern, and like I said, grumpy and everything, but she is kind of flighty and she's late to the meeting. So he immediately is kind of like scoffing at her a little bit for it. Funny because there's this moment where he is feeling all proud of himself because she says something to him that he's like, oh, when she realizes who I am and why I'm here, she's going to be so embarrassed. But instead she like laughs and that kind of happens throughout their whole relationship. And I'm going to be honest, I don't love the whole like boss employee trope. First of all, I don't like the power dynamic, but also I really don't like it when it's enemies to lovers. Man, that's kind of like a, that's kind of a thing for me because I've had horrible bosses in the past and it's not very funny to me, especially when they're like just horrible, like business wise when they're horrible. That tends to grate on my nerves a little bit. So I struggled a little bit with this one in that case. Ultimately ended up liking it, especially because of the relationship between the hero and the heroine's sister. It stuck with me and I had a whole discussion on my reading vlog about how, unfortunately, how that relationship develops and how his mind is changed about a couple of things. It's unfortunate, but it feels like especially people who have a certain kind of privilege, you don't realize that you have that privilege until you personify and see the people who don't have that privilege as human beings as opposed to just like othering them. And as soon as you see someone who's going through that situation and you know them and you care about them, then that person who has that privilege actually starts to care. And that can be frustrating, but unfortunately it was realistic. So yeah, and I am not a Disney person at all. I'm not a Disney adult. My kids are not Disney kids. Like they like Disney movies and everything, but we're not obsessed with it. And I still enjoyed this book for the most part. And then the next book was actually a reread. I reread Girls Weekend by Sam Niscosta because I found out that Sam Niscosta is having a lot of her books come out on audio, which I am so excited for. I pre-ordered a bunch of their audiobooks on Libro FM and Girls Weekend was available. So I got that one and it's super fun. I love to this book just as much on audio as I did when I read it physically. It follows a group of girlfriends and you kind of see each of their stories. Not all of them have happily ever afters, but I think the next book in it wraps everything up if I remember correctly. I'm not sure. This is a short book. The next book I think is pretty long actually. I have not read the next book yet, but this one was super fun. Very, very, very steamy. I am much more invested in certain character stories than the other characters, but I was still interested in, in hearing about the other characters. One thing I will say is that for some reason, when I was reading this book physically or having Alexa read it to me, I had an easier time differentiating who everybody was somehow, but maybe it was just because maybe when I was listening to this, I wasn't paying full attention or something because it is a reread, but I found myself getting a little bit lost thinking like who's who. I couldn't remember like who was with who and I was getting things confused a little bit. So that could have just been me, but that's just one thing to know about this book. And then I ended up picking up Seducing My Guardian by Katie Robert. I've talked about this before. I have this very unfortunate habit of thinking that guardian books are bodyguard romances and that is just not the case because I went into this thinking this is a bodyguard romance. This is like the third time this has happened to me where I think it's a bodyguard romance but it's a guardian romance and they are two very different things. In case you are like me and you get them confused, a bodyguard romance is a romance between someone and their bodyguard. A guardian romance is someone who is like a parental figure 
like a guardian. <laughs> so not like a guard, but like a guardian. <laughs> So that's not usually my favorite thing. I did end up giving this book four stars. I did enjoy it, but because it's not my favorite trope, it hasn't been my favorite book in the Touch of Taboo series. It's very, it's very Katie Robert. It's very, very steamy. It's very like short, sweet to the point, not very sweet, short, steamy to the point kind of book. And it was good for what it was. This is probably my least favorite book in the series, but I think that more has to do because this is my least favorite trip. Next, I read a nonfiction book, and it's actually a book based on a podcast that I have not listened to yet, but the book itself sounded interesting, and it was an ALC that I listened to from Libro FM. It's called Conversations with People Who Hate Me, 12 Things I Learned from Talking to Internet Strangers by Dylan Marin. And this is basically how Dylan came up with the podcast idea of having conversations with people who hate him. So Dylan is a gay man, and he kind of came up with this. He was kind of working in... I, I'm going to say the entertainment industry, but he was more like doing, um, he was doing content creation and I forget what he was doing before he came up with this concept. I think he was working for like a HuffPost type thing and he was like kind of internet personality. He went viral a couple of times, which also means that along with that, he got a ton of hate comments and he finally started like looking into the people that were commenting and saying really horrible things. And this was back when like Facebook was much more popular. So he would be able to like go to their Facebook profile and just learn all about them. He started noticing, especially this one guy who commented something like awful, awful things, these things that people were commenting. But he went to this one kid's page and he was like a young kid. He was like a kid who was in theater and did a lot of the same things that he did in high school. And he was like, man, this is like a real person. He's a whole person, like I wonder why he said the things that he said. And that's what kind of gave him the idea to start interviewing people who were leaving these horrible hate comments. And I'm going to tell you, this is not an easy book to read. I have a feeling that the podcast probably is even less easy <laughs> to listen to. I have not listened to it yet. I don't think that I could because of some of the horrible things that these people say. But what's interesting is it's doing, this book is talking about doing something that a lot of us can't even fathom doing because we get so passionate about things that other people say that we disagree with. And that's fair, especially if you are personally hurt by those things and it's personally affecting you. But I also think there's something to be said about having civil conversations because I think like, especially when he confronted these people and not in like an aggressive manner, but let them say, say their piece. But then he just kind of asked them questions like, why would you say that? And they kind of backtracked after that, at least a little bit. Sometimes they came to like an agreement of some sort, sometimes not so much, but at least the people eventually, all of them have pretty much apologized for saying the things that they said. They said it out of anger, not thinking that he would read it because they thought that he was much more famous than he was. It's just very interesting. I'd be curious to see how something like this would be done. I don't know if he's already doing it, but how something like, like this would be done in the age of TikTok as opposed to like Facebook, because this is much more Facebook age kind of thing. But it was very, very interesting. I really liked it. It was a good read. And then another book that I read for my members for a dedicated reading vlog was Things We Never Got Over. It's Knock em Out. Knock em Out? Is that what it's called? <laughs> Knock em out, book number one. I didn't realize that. It's by Lucy Scores. My first book by Lucy Score, I believe. This one definitely gave me, and this is going to be much higher praise than it should be. Not saying that I didn't like this book. I did really like this book. I gave it four stars. But it's compared to a lot with Mariana Zapata because it's a freaking big book and it's a, definitely a slow burn. I still prefer Mariana Zapata because I like Mariana Zapata's character building. I like her characters and I like... Her romances are slow burns. So there's a lot of like tension in her books. And while there is a decent amount of tension in this book, it's not quite at the level as Mariana Zapata. But anyway, it was still really, really good. I enjoyed this book. Actually, my sister read it because it was on my Audible. I had purchased it on Audible. And my sister has access to my Audible app. And she listened to it and she's like, oh my God, this book is so good. So my sister absolutely loved it. I will say that this cover is very misleading for this book. Like the cover gives me... I thought it was going to be much more of a like Catherine Century kind of women's fiction-y, like leaning more women's fiction, but still being a romance. This is definitely a romance. This is like rom-com. It does not look like a rom-com whatsoever from that cover. There is a lot of drama in it. That's one thing that I will say is Mariana Zapata's books tend to not have excessive drama. Not that the drama, no, the drama in this book was excessive. In my opinion, like the end was a little over the top for me. I had to like suspend disbelief for the entire ending for the most part. 
But I didn't not enjoy it because of that. And surprisingly enough, despite it being very long, it didn't feel long reading it. And I have not said yet what it's about. Actually, it was funny in the beginning, it gave me Gilmore Girls vibes because the heroine in this one is actually, she's actually a, like a runaway bride essentially. And she ends up in the small town and she ends up in this coffee shop. She's like definitely addicted to coffee, but it's funny because she gets there and he doesn't want to serve her because her twin sister raises hell for absolutely everybody. And because she looks identical to her, they're like, oh yeah, we can't serve you. There's like literally a sign on the wall that says they're not going to serve her like her twin sister. And everyone thinks that she's her. So that's something that she consistently has to deal with in this small town is everyone thinking that she's her twin sister. The hero in this one, he has, he is not a cop but his brother is a cop. He's described in the synopsis as beard, a bearded bad boy, and that's definitely him. It's definitely Grumpy Sunshine, and he's definitely one of those her grumpy heroes with a heart, and he kind of grudgingly is helping her throughout the whole thing, so it's fun. It's like there's a lot of tropes in this that I really like. So this next book was part of my journey in trying to find books to add to my Virgin Heroes recommendation list that I will be eventually posting a video of my favorite Virgin Heroes. And I came across this book. It's actually the second book in a series. I will be going back and reading the first book. This is a dark, 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 dark romance. So keep that in mind. It can be read as a standalone because I did not read the first book and I didn't feel lost at all. You have a very morally gray heroine and a morally gray hero, which is great because for a dark romance, I really like when both, I, I, I don't mind when one or the other is morally gray, but I actually really like when both of them kind of are. It's also a little bit of a stalkerish romance. Hero falls first, hero's obsessed with a heroine type of romance, which is really fun. It takes place in Las Vegas. That's like a big part of it. It's not really a, a captor captive situation, but it's like a for her own good kind of captor captive situation. But the hero in this, both the hero and the heroine are very, very troubled people. They both are dealing with a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma in the past. The big part of why he's a virgin hero is because of the trauma he dealt with in, a pa in the past. And it's definitely one of those situations where he doesn't think he's good enough for the heroine. It's really good and I'm interested in going back and reading the first book. I just really am so annoyed by the sister's name in this one. And then I unfortunately read this next book in my search of a virgin hero. I don't know why I finished this book. I don't know why I finished it. I think, you know what? I actually think the main reason why I finished this book was because I was driving or doing some sort of like activity and I didn't feel like stopping it and picking up another book. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna continue listening to this. But I kind of hated it. <laughs> it, it was very new adulty. I went into all of these books because I was looking for books with the Virgin Hairs, like I said, but I went into all of them completely without knowing what they were going to be about. And that was to my detriment in the case of this book. I ended up giving this three stars because it's definitely a preference for me. It's Falling Into You, Falling Book Number One by Jacinda Wilder. This is my first book by this author. In the list that I found, I think it's actually the next book that was on that list, but I read this one because I, I randomly had it in my Audible library. I forgot to mention the trigger warnings in the previous book. I don't fully remember all of them and I when I was listening to the audiobook, I wasn't at a point where I could write them all down, but just keep in mind that book is definitely a dark romance. It talks about sexual assault, sex trafficking, BDSM abuse, like a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a heavy book, so definitely look up those trigger warnings. For this book, huge trigger warning for death of a loved one, like on page graphic <laughs> death of a loved one. This book takes an unsuspecting turn <laughs> that maybe, is it even in the synopsis? I don't know. Oh yeah, it is. It's <laughs> is in the synopsis. The turn, the turn, which you can read about it if you want, is in the synopsis. I did not read the synopsis, so I did not know this was going to happen. So it came out of freaking left field for me. So maybe I would have enjoyed it better. I don't know. I felt like they spent a lot of time on this relationship to have it turn out the way it did. And then at the end of that, I think I was so shell-shocked by that that I could barely focus on the next thing that happened. I'm trying, like in case you want to go into this blind, I'm trying not to say too much, but it is said in the synopsis. So you, if you want to know what the thing is that happens in it, it's in the synopsis. So, I mean, it's kind of my fault for not reading the synopsis, but at the same time, I don't know that it was executed in the best way. Also, it reads like, like the beginning half of the book reads very much like a YA because it's like, two people falling in love for the first time, like discovering themselves, whatever. And then the second part reads very much like a new adult, like gritty new adult. So it was a little disorienting 
I guess. I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but anyway, yeah, I gave that one three stars. It will not be on my favorites list for Virgin Heroes. Okay, and then last but not least is the book that I actually finished today, and it is How to Belong with a Billionaire. It's Art in St. Ives, book number three by Alexis Hall. It's a book that I buddy read with Steph. We've been reading Alexis Hall's backlist together and his new books as they come out. But we read this one together, we've read this whole series together, and we finally read this one. We read, I, I think we read the first two books kind of back to back, and then I needed a break from it because I'm not a big fan of contemporary romances that follow the same couples throughout. I describe this as a queer Fifty Shades of Grey that's much better written with characters that are much more likable, <laughs> and that's basically what this series is. So it does pretty much follow the Fifty Shades of Grey type of timeline a little bit. I feel like this third book deviates a lot more than than the first two books did, but it has the same type of premise, except in my opinion, characters are much more likable and it's queer. It's just better all around, especially better written because it's Alexis Hall and I love Alexis Hall. Very, very steamy, really, really good. But this was a great conclusion to it. I was vaguely disappointed in like the ending a little bit, but not enough for me to give it anything less than five stars because my enjoyment of it did not fade. And I will say that taking a break from this book, for, from the series, made me appreciate this book so much more. And what was nice is that Alexis Hall somehow was able to kind of recap the first two books in a very, very fast way that definitely like caught me up to speed, even though it had been a while. But yeah, it was really good. It's filled with so many great side characters that, and even a new side character that you introduced. But I highly, highly recommend the series altogether. Like I said, there are not very many contemporary romance series that follow the same characters that I actually like, but this is one of them. All right, guys, that's it. Those are all the books that I read recently. If you want to hear about more books that I read recently, you should definitely check out my blogs. I will link some recent ones down below. And if you want to hear me talk about those two books that were member exclusives, I have a link down below on how you can become a member. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, happy reading. Mwah.